and Todd is the author of Wines of Vermont. I hope you can see this book, um, which is a detailed depiction of cold climate wines um, and the Vermont wineries that have put them on the map. And Todd's a native of Northern New York, uh, but he's lived for about three decades in Vermont. And he's also authored the Vermont section for the Lonely Planet Guide, and he's a contributing editor to the Cork Report. Um, Todd also makes wine. He has been a volunteer and a test winemaker at Cornell University's Cold Hardy Grape uh, Hybrid Trials. Uh, they have a vineyard on Lake Champlain, which is in northern Vermont. Um, and he's an avid home winemaker, um, using wines harvested from Vermont and from that, that and other vineyards. Um, so Todd really has an intimate knowledge of the wines, the wineries, the people, the producers, and kind of what makes them tick. Um, and Vermont's rise as a cold climate uh, winemaking region. So with that, I just want to introduce Todd and say thank you and I'll mute myself and look forward to your presentation. Well, great, <clears throat> thank you very much, Meg. And thanks for the group for inviting me and less so for my you know, purposes, but for the uh, op opportunity to share uh, information about Vermont and that wine is actually something that we can grow here and may continue to become uh, a new part of the agricultural economy in Vermont. Um, usually when, if anyone knows anything about Vermont and they get told that wine's being made here, that they, they kind of look, have a funny look on their face and like, how could that possibly be? And, you know, until just 15 years ago, I had the same exact notion. I, I really didn't know myself until uh, I had taken a trip up across the Canadian border and just accidentally came across their wine trail. And I was like, there's a vineyard over there. There's one over there. What's going on up here? And then very shortly afterwards, this uh, cold climate wine trial was uh, put together by Cornell in my family's hometown. And <clears throat> excuse me, I said, oh, wow, this is actually a real thing. Now, I had been a kind of a wine nerd for years before that. Um, in fact, as a youngster growing up, I was in a family of educators. Books were easy to access, so I was an avid reader. The, the second book I ever bought with my own money was when I was about 12 or 13, was a book on home winemaking. Because I had this fantasy that we were going to be able to like secretly make some wine in the basement or the closet and nobody would know. And I read the book and I was like, oh, there's no way you can pull this off without somebody else knowing that what you're doing. But it was fascinating. I read the book again, and then I put it away until about uh, 2007, when I started making wine with local fruit. Um, so I guess just for a quick background, I, I thought someday there would be the opportunity to write a book about what's going on in Vermont, but it would be sometime in the future. And then a uh, publisher who had done <clears throat> a book about Vermont beer got in touch with me and asked if I was interested in putting a book together. And I said, well, I don't know, that could be kind of a short book, but there's, there hasn't been much Vermont wine yet. And they said, oh, you can find some stories and I'm sure and put something together. And so I started digging into it and I thought it would be very easy to get information from all of the various wineries about their stories. And it turns out that wasn't as easy as I thought. So I had to kind of rethink what the, the schema of the book was gonna be like. And it forced me to kind of look back in time and really take a bigger, a better look at the, the geography, geology of the wine, culturally, how did we even get here? Um, how did the fruits get here? What, what are we working with? Uh, and in doing so, I found that Vermont actually had a much longer wine history than any of us realized in terms of commercial production, that it actually had first commercial winery in Vermont was in 1970, um, even though the most, most of our growth has been recent. And... Uh, that Vermont at one point in the mid 1800s had been a hotbed of grape breeding um, by amateurs and professional agronomists alike in the Champlain Valley, which I found through some old, uh, basically there were the newsletters, printed newsletters that were put in a newspaper and that people would write in and share information, it's basically like our bulletin boards of today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a basic slideshow just to, to Give you some of the background. Mostly it's going to be about the geography, geology, um, climate of what where Vermont is and what it can do. And then we can talk more about um, 
kind of the, the cultural processes and the people uh, involved afterwards. But I, I really feel like the geography is foundational because um, Vermont is a very interesting place on the world map in that it, um, it's, it's very old ground that has only just recently been tapped seriously for grapes. And the grapes themselves are new. So what's happening here is um, just a, a fascinating uh, explosion of opportunity from my perspective. So uh, let me see here if I can get this slideshow started. And oh, actually, let me not start it first because I need to first do the screen share. And now I'll hit slideshow. OK. So Vermont, quintessential Vermont. This is a picture of the capital in Montpelier. Um, the capital itself is actually what most people would consider a, a small village <laughs> in other parts of the world. But it's a quaint New England style um, architecture. And this is kind of the scene you can see almost any corner of the state. And that's often what we're known for is the, the, the pretty foliage, the old architecture, and our maple syrup. And cheese, can't forget the cheese. That's something that we've been world renowned in the cheese game far longer than um, wine. So Vermont is situated on the Canadian border of the United States, uh, Northeastern North America which actually does fall within the latitudes of the wine growing regions, even though we might not think it, it does because of the harsh winters we have here, or at least long winters. But Vermont is, I don't know if you can see my mouse, is boarded up against upstate New York. And people know about the Finger Lakes, possibly, which are over here in Western New York, and then the Long Island Sound, Long Island wines are also well known. Hudson Valley wines are becoming well known. So Vermont, we're, we're kind of in a neighborhood where there is opportunity. Now, from a geological perspective, our neighbors here, the Adirondacks Mountains, are fascinating. The Adirondack Mountains are probably the only remnants of the first mountains on Earth that are left um, in a visible place. Most of the rest of this rock is 15 miles below the surface of the planet. And about 40 million years ago, this dome started pushing back up for reasons that are as still yet unknown. And so the Adirondack Mountains are a range that is growing, even though the rock that it's made from is 1.3 billion years old. So Vermont's capital, Montpelier, sits here in the upper middle part of the state. Lake Champlain is the western boundary with New York. The Connecticut River is the eastern boundary. Um, I live just down here in this part of the White River Valley. Meg lives over the river this way, not too far from me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, our friends at Lagarge East live right over the hill. They're literally three miles as the crow flies, but it takes 15 minutes to drive around to get there. So this is a, a pic, depiction map of this dot here is where Vermont is. This is the equator up above here. This is a, kind of a depiction of Laurentia, one of the proto continents when the world was developing. And the coastline of this proto continent uh, was uh, a shallow warm sea in which the very first life on Earth arose. Uh, millions of years of accretion of um, single cell organisms, then multicellular organisms, then uh, worms and shells right up to um, trilobites. And this a uh, chain of islands here is actually a volcanic array, which is where Meg lives now in New Hampshire. It was at a seam in the plates where uh, this island chain was thrown up and eventually smashed against the 
protocontinent. So this spot here yielded rock that looks like this, um, which is Ordovician 450 million year old fossils. Now we off, in Burgundy, they often talk about their 250 million year old Kimmeridgian soils. Well, we've got a couple hundred million years on them. So we're kind of hoping that in a couple hundred years, we'll have figured out what to do as far as wine is concerned here. This is the geological subsurvey of Vermont, which shows a, an extremely complex um, formation of, of rock types. And so what happened is I'll try to um, explain in brief because it's a several hundred million year story, but those islands chains got pushed up against the continent and in doing so it shoved almost like a stack of a deck of cards or an accordion, this layered formation. So the state on one side is this old um, fossil bed and then on top of that was thrown the sea floor that was out beyond that fossil bed. And then this blue area is essentially vol volcanic remnants that were ero erosion of the, that island chain that was pushed across it with some protrusions of actual igneous uh, volcanic rock coming through. So that's the, this is the complex one. There's a fascinating at Vermont Law School where this is where I went and did my master's degree. When I came to Vermont, they have a, a 10 foot high version of this map. And it's really fascinating in the reading room. It's fascinating to look at. I wish I could get one, but I can't imagine how much it would cost. <clears throat> kind of a simpler geographical stratification <clears throat> gives you an idea of the kind of the major regions. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little more simple, but if you know your time periods, you can see that there's there's tens and or hundreds of millions of years between the ages of these layers of formation, which result in um, the spine of the mountains going from north to south across the state with lowlands in the west and the east, which tend to be the more fertile soils are the mountains basically serve as a, a sieve or a, a, a tap for the moisture that comes through. Our pre prevailing weather usually comes from west to east, but we do have maritime influences, so we do have storms coming up from the southeast. The general wind pattern tends to be from the north west during the winter time from the southwest during the summertime. But in any case, the mountains do a really good job of pulling water out of the sky. Whereas the um, even though in the Lake Valley, there's a lot of water down there, it tends to be very wet. And in fact, this has been a drought year all around Vermont, which has made it really hard for row crops and things like that. But the grape harvest was super because of that weather. There are four major watersheds in the state. There's the large green one, which goes into Lake Champlain, which then flows north through the Richelieu River to meet the St. Lawrence River, and then eventually flows out into the North Atlantic. The yellow area is the Connecticut River watershed, which flows all the way down through Massachusetts, Connecticut, and out into the Long Island Sound. The Hudson River watershed in the bottom left corner goes over into New York State, down the Hudson River, and pops out in also in the Long Island Sound. And then there's lastly the Memphremagog watershed up in the north, which goes nowhere. It goes into Lake Memphremagog, which is a it's the end of that water. Now that bedrock is one part of the story. The other part of the story in Vermont is glaciation. And there were several ice ages which moved ice sheets from north to south and then retreating back again. So across all these geographical, geological subformations, there is a scrubbing effect of the, of the glaciers. And in the last great glaciation about 12,000 years ago, as the glaciers retreated, debris um, 
stopped up the ends of the watersheds. And so what, what is Little Lake Vermont now was actually a massive lake that reached way up into the mountains. And then you have Lake, lake Hitchcock on the, the side of the, um, the Connecticut River Valley side, which was also an amazingly long lake. And in fact, where I live up in the, this branch, we, live, we, we are on a, a glacial bench, which is up above the riverbed. So we're about 75 feet up on a, on a gravel. Well, it starts with silt, clay, silt, sand, small stone, pea stone, gravel as, as it comes up because that was all left behind by that. So at some point about 11,000 years ago, the dams broke on these things and all the, all the water left. And then the sea flowed, at least in the place where Lake Vermont was, the, the ocean flowed back into it because the land had been depressed by the glacial sheet. And so it was really confusing for, for uh, bo you know, historians, geologists, um, biologists to figure out what the heck was going on here because they found these really old shellfish fossils hundreds of miles from the ocean. And then they found whale skeletons in the valley as well like, that were much younger. And that, so that didn't make sense either, but that's because the ocean was, was there. And, and then eventually the land rose up again, the ocean waters pulled back, the watershed filled on its own with the local rainfall. And so you wind up with very, quite varied terrain on which the grapes are being grown. From up in Cambridge, this is uh, Boyden Valley, which was one of the first vineyards in the state. They're basically up on the edge of the mountains and just over that hill is a ski area. Also up in the mountains, Huntington River. They have a beautiful spot up there on the backside of what's Mad, Mad River Glen ski area. Then you have Snow Farm Vineyard, which is down here on the shore of Lake Champlain on one of the islands. So you get a, a vastly different um, growing situation because here it's a lot warmer. They're moderated by the lake, but they don't get as much rain. Whereas up at Boyden, they're a lot colder, but they get a lot more water. So the same grape being grown in two locations can be radically different in, ex in expression outside of its you know, the base qualities. Uh, from the cover of the book, this is Lincoln Peak Vineyard, which is also in the Champlain Valley, but a little farther away from the lake and far, just far enough away that it's not moderated on the cool side during the summer. It gets really warm here. And so they're ap able to get ripening out of grapes in a way that not everybody is able to. In it, able to get Marquette that will produce wines that comes in at 14.5% alcohol without any chapitalization. Whereas Boyden's, there's 12 and a half is the most they'll ever get in a good year. Not that ABV is a goal, oops, sorry, but it's a, an indicator. This, and then this is uh, looking off the hill from La Garagista, looking west. So they're in the Piedmont of Vermont in this area where we are. So here's the, your, the classic grape porn shots. This is a uh, Marquette, which is our standard bear red grape. La Crescent, the standard bearing white. And these are the ones that everybody is really excited about because they, they ripen well, they <clears throat> can get a good potential alcohol quality. They have um, really nice winemaking properties. This is a picture I took at the Cornell Trial Vineyard of a Frontenac Gris vine with a Frontenac Blanc Sport on it. Frontenac Noir was the original release by Cornell in 1996. And then a couple of years later, uh, Frontenac Gris popped out of it. And then another couple of years later, P Frontenac Blanc. And they can actually, I've seen a Frontenac Blanc that reverted back to Gris. So, these grapes, much in the same way that Pinot has its, very, its mutations, these grapes behave in a similar way. There's a uh, Brianna, which is one that Lagarage used to use, and I wish more people would grow this one. It's grown quite a bit in the Midwest, um, but often made into kind of a sickly sweet 
wine or off dry, you know, heavily off dry wine, but I feel like it makes some really fascinating um, sparkling and dry wines and works well in blends. The, uh, the thing about Vermont vineyards is they're all pretty much, they're very lively places. Um, you won't ever see a vineyard here where the, the vineyard floor is bare to the ground because um, we're overusing pesticides or, or excuse me, or herbicides. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's not organic by default here, but in general people, I, I feel like try to spray as little as possible. They're kind of what we would call um, skin flint Yankees. So they wouldn't, they don't wanna, the farmers don't wanna have to spend any money on stuff that they don't need. Um, and I think that with some of the work of the Largarista and what Ethan is doing up at Shelburne Vineyard, people are trying to let the vineyards be themselves a little bit more and not work them as hard and finding that it's actually helping to create some really healthy ecosystems around the vines. All right, so that's the only thing, that's all I've got for pictures. I'm not, I didn't want to beat you up with a, a bunch of uh, PowerPoint because I think all, everyone's had too much PowerPoint and slideshows over the last eight months since we've been meeting like this. Um, so, and Meg, you can jump in at any time if, if yeah. you have you know questions that, that you have. Um, what I might say before we go any further is, again, the question is, why would people be growing wine in Vermont? Um, you know, it seems like a tough place to do it and real, a real challenge. And the truth is, and this is one of the things I found when I was researching for the book, was that people have wanted to grow wine in Vermont for 400 years. I mean, we, we know that the Vikings were impressed by the vines they saw growing everywhere here. Uh, Samuel de Champlain was certainly impressed. All of the early explorers were impressed by these vast wild vineyards that only needed some help in taming to certainly produce the finest wine in the world. It didn't work out like that. They, they found that the wine wasn't really that great. It was, it was hard to make. Um, and, but what happened in that process was Vines got brought from Europe to the new, the new continent and people tried to grow them and they would grow, you know, for a year or two and then they would start to fail and couldn't figure out why, but they might flower. And I think they unwittingly and unknowingly released the DNA into the ecosystem that started ha uh, arising in new, new vines that people actually did start selecting. And that led to some of what we call the native, the native vines that we can make grapes out of, like Concord, because Concord doesn't look like anything like any of the rest of the wild grapes um, that grow here. Uh, so anyways, back to the idea of why would people want to grow wine here? Well, like I said, in the 1800s, people were growing grapes, trying different um, uh, breeding tactics or selection tactics from the, from the world from the wild with the idea they could try to make wine. And again, it just never really took off from a quality perspective. And then um, Vermont agriculture was in a huge changing phase in the mid 1800s. Their huge apple crop that used to keep uh, the cities fed started moving west with migration and Vermont started focusing more on cider and apple brandy. Um, you go through the Civil War, Vermont has a, loses quite a bit of its population to this, to this a significant number to the Civil War, both uh, in life or in limb, such that um, it was a depressed place for a while and it wasn't until um, late in the, or actually can I say early in the 20th century that Vermont started to rebound from that and just in time for prohibition to happen which then put, put the kibosh on any kind of commercial wine production or the, the thought to pursue it even. So you, you fast forward a little bit into the 1960s and early 1970s, there was a, the, the, the hippie migration to Vermont, the back to the land movement, um, be, began what has be, become the farm to table movement. 
in Vermont. And Vermont's been a pioneer in this idea of locally sourced uh, sustenance. And so with that taking hold, it just becomes a, a matter of time before somebody says, well, if we can grow our own food, why can't we grow our own wine? We've been making beer here for years, but it's not necessarily with local ingredients. It's that's starting to happen. And cider is having a revival too. And I think wine is just another aspect of that. And what's been fortunate for Vermont, I think, and differs from the other parts of the country that are using these cold climate grapes, is that Vermont makers have started with the idea of we want to make wine. How do we grow the grapes to get there? Whereas in the Midwest, they are taking soybean fields or corn fields and saying, let's turn that over into grapes then we'll figure out how to make the wine. And I, it seems like a subtle difference, but I think it's a very important one in terms of the, the goal. Um, and I think that that's why um, uh, we've, I don't say a leg up, but we've definitely set the quality standard here. I saw a chat come through. Is there any hope for vinifera in Vermont? And can I, can we, can we, okay, go ahead, sorry. But, oh. There's, there's two questions. And, and one is hope for vinifera in Vermont, but also can you describe the flavors of these of these wines, because I think a lot of people don't know what the grapes are like and how they differ from or are similar to the vinifera. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So we'll start with the vinifera question. And there are little pockets of vinifera in Vermont. Um, it's the challenge is even as with global warming and maybe warmer growing seasons, is that vinifera basically below 10 degrees Fahrenheit start to start suffer. To suffer. Right? At zero degrees Fahrenheit, they could, they could be dead below the ground. And we, even in our warmest year, can still have a snap in the winter that's 30 or 40 degrees below zero. And so from an economic perspective, nobody's really going to hang their hat on the vinifera angle. Um, but they may still try. I mean, Shelburne has a patch of Riesling that they keep going, and they, they're able to get a crop out of that about every three years. Is, is there a plan? I know somebody's got a little bit of Pinot down on the lower side of the lake, but has never sold any Pinot. So I don't know how much they actually make from that. Um, as far as flavor profiles, uh, the major difference between the vinifera and the hybrids that we're using is um, the acid complex. Uh, in wine grapes, in Vitis vinifera, um, you've got mostly tartaric acid and then malic acid and then some succinic and citric and some other acids um, in, in minor qualities. With the, the hybrids, we've got more malic acid and less tartaric acid. And actually, I think La Crescent's the only one where they're about even. And so malic acid being a stronger, more strongly bonded acid, um, makes for a more pronounced fresh wine. In some cases in their youth, they can even be a little bit um, exciting, <laughs> maybe is the nice way to say it, um, and sometimes need some time. Uh, winemakers will sometimes use the approach of deacidifying the must of the wine. Uh, personally, in my winemaking, I don't do that because what happens is when you throw bicarbonate at the must, it's, the, it's gonna break the weaker acid first. So what it does is it takes the tartaric acid out and leaves you with the malic acid, which is the less pleasant acid. But what that can do is sometimes get you into a zone where your pH changes enough so that you can then go through malolactic fermentation and change the malic into um, lactic, which is a softer acid. But then if you don't have any tartaric left anymore, you wind up with a kind of a flat wine. So people put tartaric acid back in. Personally, I feel like um, this is where I appreciate what Deidre has been doing at La Garagista because whereas most everybody else kind of approached winemaking in Vermont from the university, you know, uh, UC Davis or Cornell approach, which is, okay, I'm looking at the numbers for my must. I need to get it into these parameters for it to be wine. And in doing so, it played around with the stuff enough so that we don't know what the original body of the fruit tasted like. And so by starting with just the fruit, letting it 
ferment and without touching it, we at least understand what the baseline, the flavor baselines are. And um, in terms of flavor, the yeah. red wine tend to have, they're really built around the cherry fruit flavor complex with some bramble fruit as well as my, as my take on it, to put it simply. And then um, with the whites, the crescent specifically, um, I, I kind of liken it to Riesling, not exactly in flavor profile, but in the way it moves from uh, kind of a lemon lime citrus when it's in its uh, less ripe phase to uh, stone fruit, or excuse me, like palm fruit and then into stone fruit as it gains more heat or more ripeness. And in fact, I even did slip a La Crescent into a Finger Lakes blind Riesling tasting a, a number of years ago. And people pretty said, that one's a little bit different. But the interesting part was it came out above about halfway between the, the Finger Lakes wines and the judging. So that made me think, okay, yes, it tastes a little bit different, but there must be something about the quality that people appreciate. Todd, if you had to compare these wines to European wines, how, how would, what kind of analogy might you make? I mean, you just use Riesling, but in terms of the wines or in terms of the wine regions, are there any parallels that you could draw? You know, everyone likes to try to, to do that. Um, but I've really started to come down on the side of, you know what, I think that's actually not the right way to go about it. I know it's, it's helpful from an orientation perspective, but they really are unique enough. You, you know, if you give them to a European winemaker, they'll be like, wow, I've never had anything like that before in my life. Or they'll try to search around for it. Or what happens with that comparison is people with Marquette, we're trying to make Marquette into a Southern Rhone type wine. And they say, oh, I think this tastes like Syrah. And I'm like, I, I never get Syrah from Marquette. For me, it, it's so cherry, it's, always, it's Grenache, if anything. So maybe that's kind of how it works. But you can play around with it. If you start, if you add some of the Frontenac Noir to the Marquette and maybe a little bit of Petite Pearl, you start getting something more layered that you might be able to fake somebody into thinking is something else. But I, I do, um, we've had this conversation a lot here in terms of how should we talk about the wines and inside of the circle of people that I deal with, we've kind of come to the determination that it doesn't help us to try and describe the wines as, as like something else because it's kind of a d disservice to the fruit. So I don't mean to undercut that question, but because no, no, it's a fair, I, I, it's a fair one. Because, because we have a, you know, we have a largely European, a lot exclusively European audience here who have more access to those wines and probably have never tasted a Vermont wine. Can you just yeah, I, uh, orient us a little bit about how many wineries we're talking about and the scale of production of Vermont wineries? Like how many are making, like seriously making what you'd consider to be fine wine in Vermont? Of the maybe, we we're probably like three dozen wineries in Vermont at this point. And I'd say um, of the ones that are making wine that we should hold up and say, hey, other people in the world should try that, try this. I'd say there's maybe five or six with three of them standing out um, on top. So we really are a young new region. And in terms of production, I'd say anywhere from the, at the top end would be a, maybe 4,000 cases. And on the low end, 50 cases <laughs> for, for a few people that are like amateurs. So, I mean, we, we aren't, making an impact in volume by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't know that we ever will because of the geography. Vermont's kind of a, it's a small farms type state. You know, the holdings that people are working on are anywhere from five to 15 acres, maybe 20 acres. Um, although I was talking to Meg last week and I, I've said that my one worry is that someone with some foresight will sell their property in Napa for $40 million, they're a little postage stamp winery for $40 million and come here and buy three 500 acre dairy farms in the Lake Champlain Valley and instantly decide what Vermont wine is gonna be to the world in terms of, because the production would be able to reach far enough. So, um, and inside of the wineries, there's pretty much everybody has 
several cuvées that they make, if not quite a number, because with their, everyone's still trying to figure out how is the best way to present these things. And my experience has been that while you can get really good single varietal wines, that blending is really um, the way to show the fruit in a way that makes a wine that's really wi widely acceptable and also offers the producers uh, the ability to distinguish themselves through their own, not just because of where they are, through their cuvées, because I've certainly had, you know, a, a Napa Cabernet tasting where, yep, that's Napa Cabernet. That's, yep, that's another, that's same, same barrel manufacturer too. And there's not a lot of variance. Whereas here, it's, it's all over the place. And so that's where it's actually hard to say from what Vermont wine is like. And again, given that the, the modern industry has only been here for 20 years, um, it's, it's, all, it's all brand new and we're figuring it out. So I tend to try not to peg it if, if possible and just say that variety is how you can distinguish do, us. Do you, do given the, the, the varied topography, the geology, the, the, the detail that you presented us, paints a clear picture that there's lots of variation in soils. Would, there's no sub-AVAs right now in Vermont. Would you argue for sub-AVAs? Uh, there actually there is, is a cultural area, by the way, for those for the good of the work. Yes, um, there actually is underway right now um, a project to create a Champlain Valley AVA. Mm -hmm. uh, New York State actually created an AVA on their side of the lake, and so Vermont's deciding finally deciding that we're going to do it here. And what they're going to use is the boundary of the shoreline of ancient Lake Vermont, which was that glacial lake. Um, to determine, because you need, you basically need a physical boundary um, to, to follow, to determine an ABA. Yeah. Oh, any wineries properly commercial making money and selling through merchants restaurants? Yes, the wineries are definitely, you know, co commercially viable. Um, and then this is where, you know, you decide which games you're going to play in terms of um, wholesale, export, uh, out of your own tasting room. And I think everyone has kind of grown up in the modern wine age and realized, okay, if they can sell 70% of their wine through their own tasting room, that's where they're gonna have the best financial gain um, and the ability to be sustainable. Um, and yes, we're at a stage actually with the last couple of years, the Vermont Fresh Network, which is a uh, kind of a, a network that gets state funding to promote Vermont agricultural products. Um, here locally and around the region have been working with the wineries to help educate them as to how to work with distribution, how to present to restaurants. They've also worked with restaurants to say, hey, you need to take a look at some of our local wines and see how you can get those onto your, um, onto your menus. And in fact, there was, um, it was in 2018, about this, about in January of 2018, the Farmhouse Tap and Grill up in Burlington had a, Vermont wine dinner. It was they do wine dinners all the time, but that was the first time they did that. And it was the first time it really happened anywhere that wasn't just a single winery's wines at a dinner, but wines from four different wineries were served. And they showed really well. I was impressed. And I was sitting with Ethan uh, Joseph from who's the wine grower at Shelburne Vineyard up on Lake Champlain. And we were talking, and then there was this couple not tapped on our shoulder and said, Can we talk to you guys for a minute? And we said, sure. And very nice looking couple. This, they were, uh, how can I say, well healed. He, he looked like Jason Stram and she looked like Uma Thurman. If you're looking at stars, we were, and we were both like, whoa. And they said, listen, we've, we've traveled all over the world and, you know, we like to visit wine places. We lived in Napa for a while. We've been to a lot of wine dinners. They said, this was the most exciting wine dinner we have ever been at in our life. We've tasted things like we never did before. And the stories that we're hearing are, are fascinating. We're so excited, we you know that we we did this, and I, for me that was like it was really gratifying to hear that because sometimes I think we're drinking our own Kool Aid here, and telling ourselves that the stuff is good, but to have people that are are experienced, um, taste and enjoy, is 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 gratifying. So Todd, where do you think Vermont wine is going next? Sketch out the next decade or two decades for us in your vision. 
I don't, you know, I have to say, I think that there will be um, individual standout producers that will gain some notoriety through their self-marketing or being found um, elsewhere. Um, I think it's still going to be slow growth just by virtue of the pace at which it's gone so far. Um, there's a nascent wine growing, um, the a council of wine growers, but it's kind of gone through uh, wax and wane phases over the last 10, 10, 12 years that I've been involved. And I think until that really starts to coalesce and the wine growers here actually see themselves as a unified group, there are, there are pockets of groups within the producers that work together, but it hasn't really come together as a whole. Um, I'm hoping that that's something that will happen you know, within the next 10 years. Um, I think that there will continue to be some interesting um, experimentation with the wines. I mean, the, the whole Petit Natural interest coming out of um, the natural wine sphere caught on early here and has actually been an interesting way to present some of the fruit. And in fact, I'm someone who, I've, I've made a lot of Frontenac Gris because of its malic complex. I've never really, it's never been one that I enjoyed myself even if other people enjoyed the wines. But La Garagista did a pet nat with it that I thought was just fascinatingly delicious. The, it was just lovely strawberry, fresh and, um, I, I, I can't explain how happy I was to like get over my, my own tongue obstacle with that one. Um, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, I will make a plug here that there is a, a conference, I don't know if I told you about this, Meg, called Vitinord, which is uh, a conference of cold climate grape growers mm -hmm. that is held every three years. And it's been held in Quebec, it's been in Riga, Latvia, it's been in Sweden, uh, it's in Dusseldorf, Germany, it's actually in Nebraska here, but it's going to be in Vermont in 2022. And so it was supposed to be 20, 20, December 2021, but we decided back in the March that uh, we might need to push it for a year, given the circumstances. So I'm kind of hoping that Vitinord, V I T I, NORD um, will bring some interest and be kind of a catalyst in some ways for people recognizing Vermont for what it's doing here and also internally for people to take, take ourselves a little more seriously. There's a nascent website that's being put together. Um, Vinny Nord isn't an actual organization per se. It's kind of, it's put together by the host, the hosting area. So there have been some previous websites that were kind of put together and fell apart. So one of the things we endeavored to do this time is to build a permanent website and then also put the archive of the previous video conferences there so that there'll be something to build on going forward. So we'll have speakers from local area, but there'll be folks from all over the world that'll come for that one, we hope. Any other so. questions for Todd? See Liz. Liz. I can't unmute you, Liz. Yeah, it's okay. I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me now? Um, there, there was a question about um, hybrids. Um, can you tell us more about them? Are they, um, are they sort of various native grapes that are hybridized, or are they hybridized with ones from elsewhere in the states, or, or what? Oh, the, the, about the hybrids themselves. Oh, I was going to point this out. Just a second. <clears throat> that, that great Brianna that I said I liked so much and has a, a real future. I think everyone knows this, this book, right? Yes. You probably got it on your shelf. Well, if you want to look up Brianna there, I'll show you. There's, there's a leaf out that shows Brianna's parentage chart. Wow. <laughs> So the uh, the crosses are um, are complex, and what they are is usually um, the the current generation of vines that we're working with coming out of the University of Minnesota and out of Cornell University. 
are breeding programs that go back uh, 80 years or more. And they're usually starting with the, um, the French American hybrids that rose after the phylloxera epidemic and as one of the potential solutions. So um, th that plant material was used and recombined again with local, um, local sources, Vitis riparia, Vitis rupestris. Um, uh, so that is a kind of a study all of, unto itself. There is a, a website called chateaustripmine.org, I think is what it is. But if you look up Chateau Strip Mine, it's a guy out in, uh, I can't remember if it's Idaho or Colorado, but he has got a really uh, fascinating uh, archive of parentage charts. So if you ever have any interest in finding out you know, where something came from, that's, that's a very useful resource. Oh, there it is. Thank you, May. Um, Thank you. That, that is interesting. It's, it's just um, in, intriguing because um, I'm quite interested in English wine and the hybrids we've had in England um, are now largely overtaken by the uh, by uh, the vinifera. Yeah, vinifera, exactly. But is, well, is that likely to happen? We think not. It's still going to be too cold for a long time. Here. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And again, it goes back to that. You know, we can we could grow stuff during the the, the year during this, the season, but um, whether it would survive the winter or not is unsure. It's also a matter of growing degree days. I mean, usually around the state here, I think we're, we're lucky to get 2,500, 2,600 growing, degree, growing degrees in a season, which is just enough to ripen the hybrids, but not necessarily enough to ripen the, uh, to ripen vinifera. Certainly not, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon will never survive here. Um, Marquette is one that people like to always point to the parentage of Marquette as it's because one of its grandparents is Pinot Noir. And um, from my perspective, I don't get it that at all in its flavor profile or anything, but if anything, maybe being a little bit tender in the vineyard would be where what it inherits from Pinot. Um, on the other side, it's got a grandparent Carmine, which is a Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot cross. And um, I think maybe it gets some of its color from that angle. But uh, grapes are funny, are funny creatures in that, you know, the, the seed is, is not true to the vine. And the DNA um, variance is fascinating in that, you know, that you could breed two, two red grapes together and have a white one pop out is, is, is interesting as well. But I think moving on from that, are you so happy with the hybrids that if climate changed sufficiently for you to grow vinifera, would you still want to grow the hybrids? I think people are coming to that that conclusion. In fact, like I know I've had the, the conversation with Deidre at Lagaragista a number of times, and she's like, well, geez, if I have the opportunity to grow something completely unique and unlike anything else, um, why I'm not I'm less inclined to want to grow another version of Chardonnay here when we can do something that is absolutely um, individual. So I, I I would believe though that if the change came enough, people would certainly be putting in vinifera, but they would probably it would take a long time before they would make that their the hook that they would hang on to. If anything, maybe do blends. But, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, it may be that in the next 10 to 20 years, if Vermont does become you know, distinct because of its use of hybrids, then to, to move away from that might be a challenge. I will say though, I, I was always been worried about the Finger Lakes and that they might pick up on the hybrids and because they have a lot more land space and farming available that they could kind of take over the, the space. And, it, it, they've been slow to adopt it, but I have seen in the last few years, people are starting to realize because they'll grow a Pinot all the way up the slope to the point where it's, it's dying, but then that's where the Concord starts for the grape juice. And they finally figured out that they can take a space, take out some of the Concord, take out some of the Pinot and put Marquette in there and 
have another viable kind of crop. So there's probably that kind of thing that you would see in terms of change. Great, thank you very much for some other questions. So do look at those. Uh, there was one from Marcus is about, uh, is there traditional method sparkling wine produced with the grapes grown in Vermont? Yes. Yep, there's both traditional method and uh, Petiant Natural. And I think you'll see more of that because the bubbles are catching on and um, there is a, a uh, hybrid that, that Ethan's starting to grow and I think other people in the valley are going to start playing with it called Lacadie Blanc that is, uh, was developed in Nova Scotia. And uh, they have quite a nice um, sparkling wine scene happening up there. And Ethan has done sparkling with it and it was quite tasty. I look forward to more of that. He just had kind of his first season with that, first full season with it last year. So we'll see what comes out of this year. And actually I've been a proponent of, of the sparkling wines and have been making them for several years here because I think that sparkling is another way to manage the acidity from a palate perspective, because the carbonation with acid tends to create a, a creaminess that if flat, the acid might be more pronounced. And it's food friendly. And I really think that that's one of the angles for the wines here is that they really are foodish. Um, because of their freshness and their acid complex, they have a lot of versatility um, and are great for, for mealtime. And that kind of fits with that ethos of grow your own food, grow your own wine, put them together on the table. One of my thoughts, Ethan, when you're spe uh, speaking, Todd, is um, are any of the grapes or the wines better for aging than others that we should look out for? Well, we're going to find that out. I mean, because it's it's new still. Um, but I did attend uh, two years ago. Chris Grantstrom at Lincoln Peak had a, uh, a vertical of all of his Marquettes. So we had a 10 year um, span of wines from his very first wine. And I was curious uh, what, what it was gonna be like. And I was impressed by how well the wine held up. Um, the wood was showing a little bit more in those early vintages, but that's because he had brand new oak and has over the years under, under my nudging and, and realizing to kind of dial that back a little bit because Again, in the early days, people said, well, we want to we want to be making great wine. We have to put it in great barrels and found out that well, the wines are a little more delicate than that. And they so the they had to really learn barrel management and start using more neutral wood, um, let the barrels hang around longer, which at first they were resistant to. And they said, no, we've really got to give it good oak. And I said, no, from a flavor profile, you don't want to do that. And then also take a look at your bank book because those new oak barrels cost a lot of money and they, oh yeah, you're right. And so I think we're moving in a, in a good direction there. But the point is, is that we're getting into the time now where people are gonna have libraries to dip into. And um, from some of the things that I have in my cellar that are many years old, I have a Frontenac Gris Rosé that I made that I considered not drinkable in the beginning because of its acid profile. It's now seven years old and we just opened one at a dinner not too long ago, a distance to dinner. And it was marvelous. Even I liked it and everybody else had a great time with it. But, you know, in Spain, vino tonandia, tonandia, you know, they can wait seven years to put their rosé out on the market. I don't, because they've got a, you know, a cave and they've been around for a long time. Usually here, people need to sell their wine. So I usually try to, as much as possible, remind them, put a couple cases of everything away and just keep it there so that we have a reference point. So you have a reference point in the future to know whether you can tell somebody to put that wine in the cellar or to drink it right away. So being a brand new region, we're kind of just beginning that, that understanding of longevity. Excellent, watch this space. <laughs> I'm not, are there any more questions for Todd? It doesn't appear to be, Liz. Right. Um, Thank you all very much. 
Well, I think that was absolutely fascinating. The geology is extraordinary. Um, and I always love places of complicated geology. Um, uh, I think you get uh, more interesting wines, even if you can't grow uh, the vines over the whole area. Um, and it's just great to hear of a, of a new area that's uh, where things are developing well. And who knows, in um, another 20, 30 years time, you uh, might be where England is now. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing that. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Todd, for sharing that. And I think um, we said earlier on uh, before we went live that um, uh, Les Caves de Pyrene have some of uh, some Vermont wines, the only Vermont wines you might be able to find in the UK. So I think anyone who has the opportunity to taste them ought to take that. I'm, I'd love to. So let's, uh, let's all see if we can uh, we can persuade some more people to bring them over and perhaps at some stage uh, organize a tasting. Thank you very yes, much. That would be fascinating. And, and I will say that once, once uh, this t time of COVID is over and, and travel is easier, you're all more than welcome to come and visit. Um, I think that's in a way the, probably the best way to enjoy Vermont wine is to enjoy it in its natural environment um, and in its context. And so um, I can guarantee that if you do come, we can show you a good time. We can point you really great places to eat. We have wonderful food culture here. And we actually have wine culture on top of that. There's a very sophisticated wine market here in Vermont. And so that's been one of the things that Vermont wine has had to jump across is that people here know what they're talking about, what they're tasting. So it's been a high bar for quality entry. Um, and so the fact that it's happening is a good thing and you're more than welcome to come and, and enjoy it here. That would be great for, for us, for sure. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure we would enjoy it Thank too. You. Uh, and before we um, end completely today, um, because this is the last of our uh, Let's Talk About sessions before Christmas, before the new year, um, I'd just like to say a general thank you to everyone who presented them, who's organized them and who's attended them. We've been to 13 countries during the 34 uh, sessions and they've been watched or attended by some 850 people. OK, lots of the same people have uh, come several times, but but that's a pretty, um, pretty good coverage. And so I think people must have learnt an immense amount from this. And we're going to keep the programme going in 2021, but in a slightly different form. We're going to do it twice a month because we think uh, probably life will be getting slightly nearer normal and so people will have more calls on their time. So it'll be the first and the third Friday of every month, except that the first one in 2020, 2021, we're back in the States in Oregon this time. And so that again will be on the Thursday like today. So that's Thursday the 14th of January for the first Let's Talk About in 2021. And we are also hoping that we may be all able to organize um, a few uh, virtual tastings with wine. Uh, but those will be separate from the let's talk about and there are some logistical problems with those so they may have to be largely uh, restricted or the wines restricted to UK attendees but you'll get lots more information about that um, before um, before any of them um, well once the dates are decided and in the meantime I wish everybody a very happy Christmas and very good new year rather better than 2020 thank you